In the name of Jesus Christ, the world's and our only Savior, fellow believers in him, Job did not sign up for it. Who would? Many of you know the story of Job, so please bear with me for this brief recap for the sake of those who may not be quite as familiar with that story as you are. Job lived in a 9,500 square foot mansion, 11 bedrooms, 10 and a half baths. The mansion had a 103 foot covered front porch facing west where you could sit and rock and watch the sunset and people putting out on the second green. The family room had a wall of windows facing east so you could watch the sunrise over the pond if you got up early enough. And a spacious back deck for private parties with an attached quadruple chariot garage. Job also owned a ranch with 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and staff and employees that numbered in the hundreds. God also blessed Job with a large family, and surprisingly enough, they all enjoyed each other's company. And through it all, Job retained trust, humble trust, in the Lord. One day, he turned to his wife and said, Life is good. So Job didn't sign up for it. Who would? But God allowed the devil to take it all away. Desert raiders came marching in, slaughtered his workers, and captured his cattle. A massive tornado wiped out his house and claimed the lives of all of his children, and Job himself ended up deathly sick. Why? Why did all this happen to Job? In the end, Job learned the answer. Let's face it. No one likes to suffer. We'll do anything to avoid it. We'll do anything to get relief from it. Have discomfort? Take a pill. Got some pain? Call the doctor. Got a problem? Talk to a therapist. Don't get me wrong. We need to thank God every day for the advances in medical technology and the wonderful skills of medical personnel. But the fact of the matter is that no matter how many wonder drugs are invented, no matter how helpful physical or psychological therapy may be, there will always be pain and suffering in our world. And we as Christians do not own an exemption. In fact, just the opposite. We can expect while we live in this world that the devil is going to go to work trying to make our life miserable. And he's going to probably be working overtime on us. Why? Why does all this bad stuff happen in our lives? God has his reasons. One of those reasons is that he knows us. After all, he's the creator. Ever since Adam and Eve turned their back on God's love, God knew and understood that all of their descendants would have a tendency to do the same. That people would be working like crazy to make this world and this life as easy and as enjoyable as possible. And God also knew that people who seem to be sailing along in life would tend to think of this life and this world as the be-all, end-all of their existence. But God has something better in mind. Something better than good health, clear eyesight, flexible joints, a new car, and a comfortable home. God wants sinners to live with him in heaven. So suffering is allowed by God in order to help us take a look at what this world really is, our temporary abode, to help us 
understand reality. That is the point of the gospel account from Matthew chapter 13 that I read for you from the lectern. The realities of this world make us long for heaven. That's the truth I'd like you to think about and ponder today as we explore this gospel story that Jesus told this parable. The realities of this world make us long for heaven. So here Jesus goes again in this story. The kingdom of heaven, that's his working and his activity of the saving message of his love. The working of his love in the world is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. And Jesus explained, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom, the kingdom of God. The weeds are the people of the evil one and the enemy who sows them is the devil. It wasn't as though the farmer's enemy just happened to have an alternate style of grain in the sack on the back of his pack mule. And then a few of those seeds dribbled out unintentionally along the edge of the farmer's field as this guy and his mule passed by. And no, the farmer's enemy knew what he was doing and he wanted to cause great harm. So he operated under the cover of darkness and he sowed his weed seed all over the field among the wheat. The devil hates God. And wherever the Lord God is touching hearts and minds with the saving message of his love, you can be sure that the devil is going to work like crazy to counter and undo God's work. Keep in mind and never forget that the devil's main goal in a fight against God is to try to gain control of human hearts and minds. God wants people to trust him and to believe in him and to enjoy what he wants them to have. The devil wants people to believe and trust in him, to believe his lie, that they can be okay on their own, they can save themselves and to desire whatever makes them feel good. The devil is also the master of trickery. It's not as though he's going to parade down the street with a bullhorn announcing, follow me to hell. It's not as though his evil schemes and false teaching and ideas are going to slip out unintentionally. No, God goes to work to counter Satan's efforts. Why? Because Satan works undercover. He goes at us in tricky ways by going at where we are most susceptible, he comes at us at our weak spots. The teenager was smart, athletic, and talented. But even when hanging with her friends, she felt all alone. There was something stirring, not right, inside. What it was, Satan had been sowing the weed seed of loneliness and tried to convince her that the only way to soothe the feelings of loneliness would be for her to medicate them or to get herself involved in behaviors that she knew were outside the boundaries of what God's right and wrong really are. The businessman made his mark in the company. He worked long hours. He traveled for the company. He got himself to the point where he felt he could be comfortable in earning that kind of income he had to provide for his wife and his kids, his family. But then, Satan went ahead and started sowing the seed of selfishness so that he stopped sharing, especially sharing what God allowed him to earn back with God himself. And he began to think that real joy only comes with a fat bank account. The newly married couple had a pile of school debt they had to deal with, and they knew they couldn't rely on help from their extended family. They had to downsize their apartment. That's when Satan went to work, sowing the seed of discontent and jealousy for others. 
The two kids were 10 and 12 years old. They were raised right to know the difference between right and wrong and to stay out of trouble, but then the devil went and sowed the seeds of disrespect, making them think that they knew all the answers. You can try to hide. You can try to ignore it. You can try to bury yourself in the happy times and the good feelings of living in this world, but Satan is still on the prowl. And eventually what he's going to want to do is sow the weed seed of his lies and false teaching and try to sow into your heart and mind loneliness, selfishness, discontent, disrespect. The Lord Jesus is in teacher mode today with this story, with this parable, because he wants us to understand reality, the realities of this world and all that is going on in this world and in our own hearts with the sinfulness that's there. He wants us to understand realities because realities make us long for something better. Lolium telmulentum. I'm not speaking in tongues. That's Latin. Lolium telmulentum. That's the Latin term for a weed that's poisonous and it can grow up looking like wheat. So the farmer's workers in Jesus' story were very concerned because at first they didn't recognize the weeds, the lolium telvolentum growing, but later they did. And so they asked the logical question, do you want us to go and pull them up? Well, we can't blame them for their zeal, but the farmer knew that pulling them up Pulling up the weeds might damage the wheat. So he replied, let them both grow together until the harvest. What makes Satan's schemes extra tricky is sometimes you can see the weed seed, the evil of his lies, his false teaching and ideas all around, but it seems that there's not much you can do about it. In fact, Sometimes that's how the Christian church over time in history has gotten itself in trouble. There have always been Christians who had the idea that they can be street sweepers and clean out anything that's offending the Lord God. That's what happened back in the medieval days with the Inquisition, when people who were labeled as heretics were hunted down and tortured. And that's also what goes on today when some Christians think they need to force their agenda and their ideas on other people through politics. Bad mistake. When you see this evil, the reality of our world, the devil's efforts in his sowing the weed seed of false ideas and teaching all around, and you feel like doing something about it, you better be sure that your agenda is also God's agenda. And you better think twice before trying to force your ideas on someone else. Because God has given the sword only to governing authorities in order to punish evildoers and keep the peace. The only sword that God has given to his church, to us, to believers, is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. So Jesus, once again, is in teacher mode today because he wants to offer some caution. As we live in this world, we will not be able to eradicate all the evil that goes around us. Jesus simply wants us to testify to the truth, the main truth, that there is one and only Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave up his life to pay for all sins of all people so we can stand before a holy God. And then, after testifying, let the Holy Spirit do the rest. While both good and evil, truth and error, grow together, we see that reality and it makes us long for something more, something better, something beyond. And that was the case for the workers in the story that Jesus told. But the farmer told them to wait until the harvest. The harvest would eventually come. He said, let them both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them into bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Jesus explains the meaning. Later in that chapter he says, as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The servants had to learn some patience 
waiting for the harvest. That's when the mowing would take place. Mowing down all those who've rejected God, pushed away his love, bought into Satan's lies and his false teaching and his false ideas. That mowing will happen, but not until the last day, until Judgment Day. In the meantime, we wait. But who likes to do that? Nobody likes to wait. You go to the doctor's office and you wait. You stand in line to get into a huge attended Brewers game and you wait. You go to the Department of Motor Vehicles for license renewal and you wait. We just don't like to wait. But that's what we do because God is patient in delaying the arrival of the final harvest, Judgment Day. God has his reasons for that. For one thing, God wants more and more sinners to come to repentance, to believe in him. For another thing, he wants to develop in our hearts this sense of peeking ahead and peeking over the realities of this world to what lies beyond. It's sort of like looking past a junker car that we just trashed and wrecked look past it and see a brand new Mercedes being given to us free by the person we just crashed into. It's sort of like looking past the charred remains of a house that we spent a lot of time and energy taking care of only to look up and to see beyond that a beautiful home given to us as a free gift by the neighbor whom we had ignored and forgot to talk to. It's sort of like looking up through the tears brought on by the loss of someone we love whom we thought we'd lost forever and then seeing that person standing next to Jesus, holding Jesus' hand, and in that person's other hand is a sign, I'll see you later. Jesus is in teacher mode today with this story, with this parable, because he wants us to long for the glories that will be ours in heaven, earned by him and freely given by him, and not get caught up in looking at all the evil around us. At the end of a novel in a section entitled Note from the Author, a contemporary book writer wrote these words. We are now in a time of change so dramatic that it rivals anything before. We have more sheer information available to us than ever before at speeds faster than ever before. Technology continues to make our lives more comfortable, more productive, we are living longer and with better health. All in all, it's a very rosy picture. So why, why are we so miserable? New horrors inflicted by humans upon humans have become a daily occurrence and we seem to grow less shocked with each one. When acts of depravity <clears throat> are committed these days, their details are disseminated with internet swiftness. I see weary countenances everywhere. There is no margin of error. There is no room to be merely capable and willing. Either you are the best or you are not. Either you win or you lose. The clear result of all this is that there are angry, frustrated, vastly disenchanted people tramping through life at all levels. His tone and words express reality. Unfortunately, this author, at the end of his note from the author, offered very little hope except to learn from the past and to try to be more civil. Jesus' parable is different. He's in teacher mode today because he wants us to learn what Job learned in the end. Take heart. God is still in charge. God will not allow the devil to take away your eternal joy. Yes, there is the reality of people buying into Satan's lies and underneath his heel. Yes, there is the reality of pain and suffering in this world. But God allows that to happen so that we long 
and look past it and long for our eternal goal. And that goal is guaranteed because of what happened 2,000 years ago outside of Jerusalem. As Jesus died, God's wrath was satisfied for every sin on him was laid. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. But bursting forth that glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. Because of that, you and I, Jesus says at the end of his story, because of that, you and I will shine like stars in the kingdom of the Father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Amen. And please stand.